The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Peter Clark. This is Ear to Asia. This ecosystem will form in millions of years, but it is disturbed in a relatively short period. So what do you expect to rehabilitate or restore? And socially might be a challenge because you are talking about people around it or people within the ecosystem. Issues related to ownership of the land. Also, security is crucial while you are restoring this degraded ecosystem. If you let the nature take its course, it does recover and it's beautiful. And quite often there's a lot of negative stories about Indonesia, but very little positive media about the efforts for rehabilitation. And the people who are working on the ground in these unhumane conditions, 100% humidity, planting those trees, staying in these remote camps, there's no electricity, no nothing. You live there for weeks, planting, planting, planting those trees. So there's a lot of positive story going on in Indonesia. In this episode, how the future of Indonesia's peatlands will shape climate change. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. The recent return of the El Nino weather pattern after a three-year break has left people in many Southeast Asian nations bracing for the potential return of the acrid, choking haze that has periodically blanketed large parts of the region for much of the past 50 years. The primary cause of this phenomenon is widespread burning of peatlands in Indonesia during the dry season. Indonesia is home to over 24 million hectares of peatlands, accounting for approximately 36% of the area of our planet's tropical peatland. Most are located in Kalimantan, Indonesian Borneo, and Sumatra. These peatlands not only support globally significant biodiversity, but also store vast amounts of carbon, playing an important role in mitigating climate change. Yet, Indonesia's peatlands are now under severe threat from agricultural expansion and land use changes. Draining of peatlands for oil palm and pulpwood plantations, in particular, releases large quantities of greenhouse gases. Once drained, the peat is also highly combustible and susceptible to fire during the dry season. So, how much does burning peatlands contribute to greenhouse gas emissions? What restoration strategies can help repair damaged peatlands? And how can Indonesia balance its development needs while also protecting the environment and contributing to global climate goals? Joining me on Ear to Asia are two experts on Indonesia's peatlands and their role in mitigating climate change. Professor Daniel Modiyaso from IPB University in Indonesia is also the president of the Indonesian Academy of Science and was part of the IPCC team that shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore for their work on climate change. Daniel is also principal scientist at the Centre for International Forestry Research and World Agroforestry, more commonly known by its acronym C4. Our other guest is Dr. Lyuba Volkova from the University of Melbourne School of Agriculture, Food and Ecosystem Sciences. Welcome to Ear to Asia, Pak Daniel and Lyuba. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Lyuba, let's start on the task now for our listeners on exactly what is a peat bog and more particularly what is peat and how it's formed. Start the description. Take us into one of these tropical peatland forests because they are really forests rooted in those extraordinary peat bogs. Let's start with that basic question, Luba. What is peat within these peatlands and how are they formed? So peat or peat swamp forests are tropical moist evergreen forests which are growing on waterlogged environment. And because they always over submerge in water, the dead leaves and wood from trees are not fully decomposing and they accumulate there over time and over years they create this deep layer of organic material and they form this big 
peat domes on which that forest is actually growing. And peat forest is usually surrounded to other lowland forests. So if you and I were to walk within one of these forests, what would it be like? Is it sort of spongy and a bit unstable? Yes, it's quite spongy. It depends also on the season, if it's a dry season or wet season. In wet season, you either can't walk through it, you will need a boat, or you will walk and constantly submerge in the pit because it's so soft and so easy to fall into it. You said they're deep. How deep? Well, pit dome can be up to 20 meter depths. It's like a, a little mountain, but underground. So depending on the position on the dome, it can be meter two, three, or up to 20. Daniel, what specifically has made Kalimantan and those regions form peat bogs? What topographically, what geographically has been conducive to forming these peat bogs? Peat is made up of partly decomposed uh, vegetation material, uh, biomass, and it is formed over centuries in a waterlocked conditions. Those three components are very important. Organic material slow decomposition, and water log. So unless you have those three, you will never ever have pitland. Pitland can occur from the coastal zone up to the high altitude. And if you're talking about tropical pitland, it's mainly dominating the hinterland, but you can find pit on the coast as well. So altitude-wise, it's quite ranging from place to place. And Kalimantan is generally flat, but you can find high altitude peat as well. Compared to the forest itself and all that carbon within the wood, is a peat bog with its layers of accumulation much richer in carbon? And how much richer? Well, yes, Peter, it's very rich. It's claimed to store up to 550 gigatons of carbon in its soil. And above ground in the intact state, swamp forests are very carbon dense forests. They can store up to 250 tons carbon per hectare. But that this is lower than Australian forests like mountain ash or pine ash above ground. Below ground, yes, Australian soil would store one to two percent of carbon in the first 10 centimeters of soil. In Indonesia, carbon concentration will be up to 50. We're talking about very wetlands. Where has all that water come from? Is it mainly from rain or are there other ways that water has found its way into forming those peat bogs? Luba? Well, mainly rainfall, but they're also surrounded by river deltas and flood plants and lakes. I've just been looking at some extraordinary videos of these forests. And for people imagining, perhaps after hearing about the bushfires in Canada on the tundra and those big burning peat bogs there, these are forests and very dense forests. Daniel, what sort of biodiversity are we talking about within those Indonesian peatlands? It's very rich in terms of fauna, but also in the flora. It's very unique environment. You can find lowland peatland, and they are rich in flora, but you can also find many different faunal species in this particular ecosystem. The trees that grow within these very wet environments are not just your average trees. These, there's something going on there in terms of adaptation that perhaps you could describe them. Yes, they are very specific, uh, unique in terms of site requirement to grow and flourish. So you cannot introduce any lowland species in tropical peatland if you are trying to restore degraded peatland. So it's very important to look around what is native in terms of site requirement. So when they are cleared, which we're going to be describing later for agriculture, etc., when they are cleared... Is there a degradation of the nutrition within the soil? Well, not only nutrition, but when we are talking about fauna, there is also important component of the microfauna, and it's mainly in the soil. So when it is degraded, you know, it's not affecting only the macrofauna, but also microfauna, especially when fire is involved. The disturbance uh, of fire also going deep down to the soil that's affecting how this particular ecosystem will be restoring 
themselves, or if it is aided, uh, one has to consider about the degradation of microfauna. You have some of these macrofauna. Let's start with them. And of course, there's an iconic one, the orangutan, being, I guess, one of the apex mammals there. Just take us through some of the biodiversity that you've experienced directly yourself within those peat bog forests in Indonesia. Well, we set up our plots in a secondary peat swamp forest, which was locked 30 years ago, clear felt, but then was left to itself to recover and it did recover and had beautiful trees there. And when we came into this forest, the orangutan nest was above us, our heads, and the orangutan was kind of letting us know that he or she was there and was like doing this sound communicating that here we are sitting. So it is beautiful. And when we walked in Sibangu National Park, we had a lot of little gibbons just jumping over the tree tops when our boats was passing. And we saw the scratches of a local bear on the trunk of some trees. So uh, there's a lot of beautiful biodiversity in those forests. It's pretty magical feeling when you're there. It's like in a Pocahontas movie. Yes, the orangutan is very useful to represent biodiversity. But the issue is much more than that because they can live there because the three species really appropriate for them to provide food. The way they build their nests, it has to be particular species. It's not any three species can be used for this macrofauna. But they are also affecting what's going on with the microfauna. Again, the representation by orangutan is very important. But if you go down, deep down in the soil, the microfauna is very rich. But at the same time, it's also very vulnerable when disturbance occur. Among others, the microfauna, which is important, is the fungi, any kind of termites or insects. Those are very important components when you are talking about decomposition and enriching in terms of nutrient in a relatively poor soil environment. So the importance of this microfauna is really there because they will help uh, decomposing organic material to enrich the nutrition composition in the soil. Is it comparably a rich environment for growing or is it a relatively poor environment for growing? It is very poor because they are very fragile. It's decomposed in a very anoxic or lack of oxygen. But when it is oxygenated or exposed, everything will be deteriorating very quickly. So the anoxic environment is a good thing to have and will keep the soil environment rich because it's slowly building up you know, in terms of nutrient. Luba, one thing I just want to be very clear about, tropical rainforest peat bogs in Indonesia, their ability to store carbon, what is the percentage comparison in terms of the carbon mass and just how much is stored? So tropical and temperate, they cover about 3% of land area and peatlands and mangroves are the biggest carbon storage due to this very specific environment. and. Indonesia has more than 24 million hectares of peatlands, and it's a country with the biggest storage of peat in the world. The global reservoir of peat uh, is about 600 billion tons. That's carbon. So if it is emitted, you have to multiply it by four. So keeping this uh, reservoir intact is very crucial. And the tropic uh, will have somewhere around 30% of this global storage or reservoir, so it's about 200 billion tons. Duba, I know as part of your research, you have shoved augers vertically into the peat bog. So what do we find in those samples? Well, Peter, so when we shove our auger down the peat dome and we're trying to, to reach the mineral soil because we were interested to estimate how deep was the peat, so you keep pulling and pulling layers of organic matter, so kind of decomposed, watery. So it will be leaves, twigs, or everything which is dropping from those trees. 
And in Australia or any other not pit environment at all will be very quickly decomposed. But because it's water submerged, they're very, very slow. So everything is very slow. Yeah, it is, it is very important to understand, as Luba said, that tropical peatland and high latitude peatland is quite different in terms of the composition. So in the tropics, you still have woody stuff in the soil. And as it is uh, submerged, it is decomposed very slowly. So you can expect to have woody stuff for quite some time. What I mean by some time here is long time. Well, in, in the temperate zone, most of this stuff are fibrous. So it can be decomposed relatively quickly. So when you are talking about how do you feel when you are standing on top of peat in the temperate zone, it's, it's really bumpy. But in the tropic, you can end up with very hard kind of surface and probably also watery like a lake because, you know, inside there are still woody parts of the peat in the soil. So, Luba, where do most of the fires start and how does that happen? The so fire probably starts when it's dry, when peat is dry, and then it will usually start by accident or an ignition. So anthropogenic source. In contrast to Australian wildfires or bushfires, where we see the huge flame and you run for your life or it's too late to run, in Indonesia and peatlands, the fire will be smoldering. So it's mostly will happen underneath of the surface. And we were actually setting up our plots five meters away from the fire front. And we are waiting three or four days before fire will reach us. So in Australia, fire can jump 20 meters with good wind. That's the big difference. And in Indonesia, it's purely smoldering. It's a slow propagating smoldering fire. And it will burn for months because peat is such a rich organic matter, 50 to 60 percent of organic matter. And it will smolder. So peat materials quite often used for domestic heating or cooking or anything, especially in temperate and boreal zones. Yuba, what are the typical ignition events? You mentioned accidental ignition. Is it lightning? Is it people burning off? How do they start? And is it possible to put them out or do they just let them burn? Well, in Australia, many fires are due to lightning strokes. In Indonesia, I don't know, Daniel may correct me here, but... uh, The fire we attended in 2019 in Kalimantan was just an accidental ignition by a couple of electricians trying to fix lines, and they started cooking tea or something, and the fire escaped. And then it started in May. In July, we came back, and whole central Kalimantan was in smoke, pretty much from that smoke source. And yes, this the teams of people and and the fire brigade who's trying to put the fire out. And yes, people are not happy about fires and trying to suppress them as fast as they can. That's my impression. Maybe Daniel has more insight into this issue. The dryness uh, that Luba mentioned, uh, there are two different dryness. One is the climatological drought which is caused by, you know, extreme weather event like El Nino, but also dryness considered as hydrological drought, meaning that in terms of water content, the environment is getting drier and drier, and it's often related to what people are doing in draining the soil, draining the peat for particular purposes. So if the two things uh, occurring at the same time, the same place, then the drought is very serious. And the way to extinguish fire should be different. Unfortunately, in, in those dates that Luba mentioned, 2015, people are trying to drain the landscape to use the water in the drainage canal to extinguish fire, which is exactly should be the opposite. When the drainage canal is used, then uh, you have a better chance to get the hydrological drought more serious. So instead of using the existing water on the landscape, you have to bring water from somewhere else. So 
by knowing the difference drought, climatological and hydrological drought, we have to treat fire differently. As you probably realise, we've got the bushfire season starting early here in Australia at the moment, and one of the things they're contending with are high winds driving some of these fires, really severe fires. But if it's in a peat bog under the ground, I'm just trying to imagine a dried out, rather porous, carbon-rich material and the fire spreading radiating almost off in many directions. That's the challenge for firefighters, I guess. Daniel? That's right. And oftentimes, it is not appearing on the surface. So instead of having flaring fire, you, you have smoldering fire. And it's more difficult to extinguish in that situation. You have to dig and expose the fire source and then hit that one with equipment that you have. So water bombing in many cases is not very effective if you are dealing with, you know, underground fire in pit situation. Say you've got a really deep peat bog, as described by Luba earlier. Can the fire get right down deep, really deep? Well, two meters, that's quite normal in terms of smoldering fire. And it can last for weeks or even months, you know, with haze, pollution and things like that. I alluded to the haze crossing great swathes of Southeast Asia in the introduction to this podcast, but let's analyse together now what's coming off these fires in terms of the emissions. We've already described the carbon-rich content of those peat bogs. So the emissions, I'm assuming, are very heavily loaded. Is that correct? Yes, uh, we did measure that in 2015 fire. And uh, if you burn one gram of peat, you will emit 1.2 gram of carbon dioxide. It's not to take into account the other greenhouse gases like methane and N2O. Luba, what has your research demonstrated and made clearer about what those chronic fires, those long-lasting fires, actually do to contribute to global warming? Well, so there is a big difference between fires we have here and peat fires or bushfires and peat fires. As I said earlier, bushfires, they're mainly flaming combustion, so very difficult to suppress in the sense that you don't want to be in front of this fire, yeah, because flying very high and moves very quickly. But the advantage is that those fires are not dominated by smoldering combustion by high level of PM, particular metamaterial like PM 2.5 and PM 1. Uh, but mainly CO2 and CO. So it's smoldering fires. They're more dangerous for human health because of the high concentration of PM stuff and nutrient oxide and methane and so forth, like 90-something gases which will be released in fire and in smoke. So from your experience and your research, do Indonesian authorities have a huge challenge in the first instance analyzing and monitoring and recording their emissions. Luba? Yes, and it's not just emission, it's for human health, it's a smoke. Smoke is the problem for everything, for not flying airplanes, for damaging crops and so on. And that's something we raised, me and my Indonesian collaborators, and actually also with Daniel and C4, we were trying to apply for several grants, trying to bring international community to the issue of smoke and the need for Indonesia to have a smoke detection system and a smoke prediction system from fires like we now develop in Australia, which is called AQF, Australia Air Quality Forecasting System. But we were not successful. We tried through Canadian and U.S. Uh, bed with C4 together, and we tried differently with Australian government, DFAT, Department of Foreign Affairs, apply for some small seed fundings to raise this issue and say, hey, guys, we really need to develop something like that so that people in Indonesia are aware how much smoke or how much PM they inhale in and how bad it is for their health. In terms of emission, it is important to have what we call emission factors. So Indonesia has been trying very hard and get a lot of support in developing the forest reference emission level, including those from uh, pit environment, from pit land landscape. So the emission factor is a very crucial part of the calculation 
we have been doing research a lot to develop and find out what is the emission factor in various pit environment, be it natural or converted pitland, and also emission factor from fire. So by understanding those emission factors, uh, you can estimate how much is going to be emitted in a landscape with different kind of management. And then with that numbers, you can also imagine or plan how to mitigate that in terms of land use, including improving the hydrology, avoiding fire, and, and those things which cause emissions. What are the chief strategies that you're perceiving within Indonesia at the moment to reduce the risk of fires on peatlands? The main thing is, as peatland is a wetland, you have to make peatland wet again. So that's the, not magic, but the, the primary effort that has to be made here. This re-wetting peatland is very crucial. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its society's politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Peter Clark and I'm joined by researchers of Indonesia's peatlands and global warming, Dr. Luba Volkova and Professor Daniel Modiaso. Daniel Luba, let's discuss agriculture and horticulture. Daniel alluded earlier to clearing of the lands and I guess palm oil, the palm oil industry is front and centre and all this, but other examples as well. What happens when a peatland is cleared? Is it just flattened? Is it just, is all that peat scraped off? What actually happens to make it at least ostensibly useful for agriculture and horticulture? Daniel? First thing is they, they clear the forest to get the wood out and get the land cleared. And after that, people drain the water. And that's the main problem uh, we have now with the drainage canal and everything. You, you have extensive draining, and that's in itself cause emission because the organic material of the peat is exposed to the atmosphere and they will be oxidized. And oftentimes it's also followed by fire and it's never accidental fire. It's always ignited by somebody. So that, that will immediately emit uh, carbon dioxide in that kind of operation, be it small or large. Luba, let's imagine that I've cleared some land, the forest, the peat bog, as described by Daniel there, and I plant my palm trees. How well will those palm trees do? Will they survive long term? Well, they will survive couple of rotations, but then they will require very heavily fertilization because in itself, peat soils are very nutrient poor, yeah, due to this slow decomposition of everything. But it's any plantation, even in Australia, after two rotations, you either change the crop or pour a lot of fertilizer into it because crop will take only nutrients out of the soil. So we're essentially then describing a monoculture and the problems inherent in monocultures. Yep, yep. Now, I'd like to turn our attention to the Mega Rice Project, or MRP. This was a colossal project undertaken by the Indonesia government in the mid-90s to convert an immense area of peat swamp forests in Kalimantan into rice paddies. Daniel, it was an ambitious project that ultimately failed. What went wrong? Well, it was, I think ill design in terms of drainage and the way the water should be managed. Because if you look at the map right now, you can still see the canal and the network of canal, which is, I think, about 6,000 kilometers. And you can imagine how much water was drained in that period. So with that kind of speed in drainage and emission, now the, the soil is getting poor and prone to fire. So the lessons learned here is opening up peatland in such a scale is quite risky. So if uh, one will have to convert 
land, it is very important to note that mineral soil should be prioritized instead of peat soil. Whether or not there are still remaining mineral soil to be converted, I don't know. But the lesson was very clear. It was very expensive environmentally as well as economically. You use the term ill-designed, so not sufficient forward-thinking research on whether there was a mismatch with the plants, the soils, etc. Was that central to the failure of the MRP? Yes, I think it's very important in that kind of stage. If we have, again, opportunity to do that, one has to sit together. All stakeholders should be involved. Academia should be there to give opinion, which did not happen at that time. Yeah, so in, in addition to Daniel, the Mega Rice project was started in 1996, and I think it was about a million hectares of peatland allocated. And as Daniel mentioned, everything was cleared, drained, and the rice field were created, but they failed. So a, they opened a lot of canals, roads into the pristine forest. So they pretty much opened the gate for illegal logging on an encroachment of soil, but also the project itself was not successful because rice didn't have enough nutrition to grow in those soils. One thing I didn't clarify completely with you earlier, Luba, was is there any pristine peat bog rainforest in Indonesia? Well, that's the question we also ask several times, and we were trying to reach it in Sibangu National Park, which is in the central Kalimantan, and we were riding on a boat for three or four hours, but still we're seeing the signs of previous logging and some even current illegal logging or encroachment into the forest. And my colleague, an Indonesian, probably Daniel will correct me here, suggested that the most pristine pits from forests in Papua on the most unreachable highlands areas of Papua. Daniel? Yeah, there are some pockets of pristine pit swarm forests also in Sumatra. You can find in Kampar Peninsula. In Rio province, I think it's about 400, 500,000 hectares still intact. And I think it is being managed by a company in order to be able to protect that. So the concession is called conservation concession or restoration concession. So uh, there are some spots like that in Sumatra, but also in Kalimantan. Sabango is one, as Lua mentioned. Dano Santarum in West Kalimantan, a bit higher in terms of altitude. There are also some unique upland peatland and uh, relatively protected, not pristine. What are the commercial values of these peatlands and what are the economic and, I guess, inevitably political forces at work to clear these lands and to plant largely uh, palms for palm oil, but other crops as well? What are the economics at work here? Daniel? Well, expanding um, industrial crops, including palm oil, and uh, pulp wood are uh, very problematic in terms of expanding the economy. But it's, it's very often that the destination would be this vast ecosystem called peatland, unfortunately. But there are also some correction happening right now. And if it is, you know, fall under conservation area, the uh, concessions should be rearranged or cancel the permits. Daniel, is there existing environmental legislation that would help control some of these operators? And is added legislation needed in your view? I think the, the existing regulation is quite clear in terms of how permits should be given or concessions should be given because there are issues like pit depth, uh, hydrology situation, etc. The problem is when it is going to be implemented, there is process that need to be done at the ground level is to verify whether the border or jurisdiction of the concession is correct or not, which is not always the case. So what I was saying about correction, it happened to about 200,000 hectares of concession for oil palm, which occurred to be in a relatively deep pit. And it has to be cancelled. And the government is doing 
very hard to do that, you know, given the existing regulation that also apply for them. So they have to be fair in that case. Duba, I'd like to just quickly discuss now, what are the conditions required for the recovery of these peatlands, as crucially important as they are to the environment and to combating climate change and global warming? What are the essential conditions required for those degraded peatlands to recover after fire, according to your research? Well, as Daniel mentioned, they need water. So they first need to rewater those peatlands. And that's the brilliant job is done by local people working for the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. So they block the canals and by blocking the canals, they live in the uh, water level higher. And also there's a lot of nurseries exist where they grow in seedlings and then going into beyond peatlands and replanting them again. So what our research identified that there's a lot of uncertainty what species to plant. So there's some species which will grow very well by themselves. They don't need any artificial replanting. But other species which are quite endangered, they probably need help in planting to add to the biodiversity and abundance of the peatlands. So research into those species is required. So where to plant them and which one we found in our study on biodiversity aspect for degraded peat swamp forest that people really don't know what they should be planting. So I guess I'm in my mind thinking of two things. After a fire, where there's obviously a lot of destruction, but is it possible to rehabilitate something that's been cleared and had palm trees planted in it, for example? Could you clear fill the palm trees and recover a peatland or is that an impossible task? It's possible. It is absolutely possible. Just let the nature do its work. 15, 17 years on the landscape level, biodiversity reach the same level as it was in long undisturbed forest. And the example I said earlier today about this um, orangutan sitting on a tree was from the purely secondary pit swamp forest, which was clear felt locked 20 years ago. So it's possible. We need just resources to support Indonesia in these planting efforts. We also need resources to block those canals and protect water from drainage and research what species best to plant if we're going with artificial replanting. Here in Australia, the idea of rehabilitation of of natural woodlands, etc., has become something of a joke because mining companies particularly are notorious for saying, yes, we're going to rehabilitate after we've dug the big holes, but nothing much ever happens. And we have a very different ecosystem, the more arid environments where the wattles move in, the colonising plants, and what comes back is nothing like the original bushland. But from your description, Luba, it seems in those tropical settings, things not only happen faster, but perhaps return to something closer to the original? Well, that was my observation. And yes, if you let the nature take its course, it does recover and it's beautiful. And quite often there's a lot of negative stories about Indonesia and about, you know, deforestation, clearing and so forth, but very little positive media about the efforts they do for rehabilitation for the huge BRG, Peat Restoration Agency, and the people who are working on the ground in these unhumane conditions, plus 40, 100% humidity, planting those trees, back going them, taking them on the boats from nursery and staying in these remote camps. There's no electricity, no nothing. You live there for weeks, planting, planting, planting those trees. So there's a lot of positive story going on in Indonesia and and by itself, nature can recover. And yes, we should protect them from fires. They're super, super sensitive to fire damage because they're not fire adapted ecosystems. But even in, in Australia, Peter, my research here for fire adapted species shows that we now need to protect our forests from next fire because it's too much, too much for everything, for any ecosystem in Australia or in Indonesia. Daniel, I noticed there are various projects underway in Indonesia. We touched on economics earlier, of course. We didn't really put a fine point on it, but there are a lot of citizens involved here, villages, sustainable, horticulturalists, etc. So 
many of those would need alternative livelihoods while rehabilitation is being undertaken. Could you describe some of those projects for us? And are they effective? Well, uh, I forgot to mention in the beginning of this conversation that this ecosystem were formed in millions of years. And that's been stable for many, many years, but it is disturbed in a relatively short period, five years, 10 years. So what do you expect to rehabilitate or restore this in a short period? With that in the context, it is very important to remember that you know, restoring and putting back to the original situation is almost impossible, I would say, in realistic term, because the formation of the ecosystem, not only the peak, but the entire ecosystem is so slow and long. So putting back in that context is quite a challenge. Technically speaking, as Luba said, it's possible, uh, but the speed is unexpectedly very slow. So technically, yes, but socially might be a challenge because you are talking about people around it or people within the ecosystem, issues related to ownership of the land and also security to manage that land, especially by local communities, is very important and crucial while you are restoring this degraded ecosystem. So if you are trying to to involve them, it has to be clear from the very beginning who owned the land. If it is still unclear, then you know the effort will be very wasted because you involve people, but they don't have the land. That's not the way they want. Okay, as we draw our conversation to a close, let's look at what are the solutions, what possible role there could be for other nations, other international bodies to protect the peatlands in Indonesia. Daniel, is there a role for others outside the country of Indonesia and, of course, within the country? What are the solutions? Well, the restoration of peatland and recently mangrove has already began and it has to be continued with more scientifically based reason how to do it. So the triple R approach is very iconic and very important to implement. And I think the managers and also government is trying to incorporate that more and more these days. For example, if you introduce new species, is it native? If you put back trees in second R, because the first R is to re-web, the second R is to revegetate, you have to think about whether the species will be able to adapt with the environment. And then the third R is to revitalize uh, the economic activity of people. So I think Australia or international community to help Indonesia because we also drive the demand for palm oil. Yeah. And uh, Indonesia, one of the countries who produce most of the palm oil. So as international community, we should support Indonesia in, as Daniel earlier mentioned, in this development and improvement of emission factors so that the country has a clear understanding of the emission from different sources are also in to help Indonesia with the developing that smoke forecasting system so that ordinary people are aware what they inhaling with those smoke and what the effect it has on their health. Also, research into the restoration of peatlands and the livelihood, what the alternative livelihood we can give them if we're not letting them to clear peatlands and to produce palm oil. Daniel, the politics in Indonesia are very complex and there are a lot of forces at work here. How do you feel about those political dimensions? Well, everywhere is complex, not only Indonesia, I think. In in no particular situation, I mean, from the scientific perspective, is whether the plan, which was nice five years, ten years ago, will be continued. The sustainability and continuation of the policy is very crucial. We are in the wait and see kind of mode, if you wish. Daniel Luber, we're very grateful you could join us on Eat Asia. Thank you so much for this discussion. My pleasure, Peter. Thanks for involving me. Thanks, Luba, for inviting in this conversation. Thank you, Peter. It was a pleasure to be here.
Our guests were Professor Daniel Murdiaso from IPB University in Indonesia and Dr. Lyubo Volkova from the University of Melbourne. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate and review us. It helps new listeners find the show and put in a good word for us in your socials. This episode was recorded on the 2nd of November, 2023. Producers were Kelvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Peter Clark. Thanks for your company.